All right. Pack crowd. Hey, Nally, you Nally's like, I'm out. I got trivia. It's okay. The trivia for tonight is more appropriate for the board and the cabinet than members of the public. All right. Um, all right, it's 7.30. Let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the June 27th meeting of the Berkeley School Board, our last meeting of the 17-18 school year. If you want to follow along on our online agenda, you can do so on your phone. You can also borrow a computer from Ms. Chaidez, who's right over there. I'd like to remind everyone that our uh, board meeting is being broadcast live on YouTube and on the radio on 89.3 FM. Are we, uh, this, are we broadcasting on cable channel 33 still? Anybody? Yes? Okay. And on cable channel 33. This means that our meetings and anything captured on video will be archived online and will be online forever. I will now call the open session of tonight's meeting to order at 7.30. For the record, closed session began at 5.00. 35. Ms. Chaitis, uh, please share with the community members present our process for transition of the meeting, and then please call the roll. Buenas noches y bienvenidos. Si hay alguien que desea dirigirse a la mesa directiva durante el periodo de comentario público y necesita traducción de inglés al español, favor de hacérmelo saber. Muchas gracias. Director Karen Hemphill. Here. Director Beatriz Leva Cutler. Presente. Director Ty Alper. Vice President Julia Pell. She's excused today. Excuse. Uh, President Josh Daniels. Here. All right. Uh, we will now approve uh, the agenda. Any requested modifications? Changes? Other items? I'll make a motion to approve. Motion to approve by Director Little Cutler. Is there a second? Second. Second by Director Apple without objection. The agenda is approved. All right, I will now report out of closed session. Uh, pretty, pretty detailed closed session. Um, item 3.1.1, public employee discipline dismissal release was pulled from the agenda. Um, item 3.1.2, this is conference with legal counsel, existing litigation. Uh, for all of three of those claims, we discussed and gave direction. So that's 3.2.1, 3.2.2, and 3.2.3. Uh, for uh, <clears throat> the three collective bargaining items, 3.3, 3.4, and 3.5, with BCCE, BFT, and Local 21 respectively, we discussed each of those items. <clears throat> On item 3.6.1, uh, this is the conference regarding real property negotiations, uh, the property being this property, as uh, negotiating with the city of Berkeley. We have nothing to report on that item. Um, for public employment, uh, 3.7.1, the superintendent, we discussed this item. 3.7.2, uh, by a vote, a uh, motion by Daniel, second by Alper, vote of four to zero with Appel, Vice President of Public absent, we authorize the superintendent to appoint employees during the board's summer recess. And we did not discuss item 3.8, superintendent's evaluation. All right, now on uh, to, uh, so before we, we do the highlight of the night, we'll start out with a brief overview of tonight's meeting. As I mentioned earlier, this is the final meeting of the 1718 uh, school year for the governing board um, and uh, we're sort of doing a bunch of sort of end of year items. We are approving our budget for next year. This We had a public hearing and discussion of this item two weeks ago on June 13th and we are also approving our local control and accountability plan. Again, had a uh, public hearing and discussion on that item two weeks ago. So we don't anticipate that those two items would be incredibly long. Um, in, in addition, we are going to uh, be discussing 
um, process and timeline for 1819 budget reductions, and then an update on the BUSD hiring process um, that uh, we sort of adjusted, had a presentation on, on adjusting it uh, <clears throat> a few months ago. Um, and then we will be looking at our uh, policy around debt issuance and management. I'm sorry, in terms of closed session, I thought we did vote on the terms of the agreement for the chambers. Uh, so we, But not the lease agreement itself because that would be an open session. So we don't, have any, we don't have anything to report out. That was part of the discussion. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah, tonight's meeting. So um, if you are able to stay, um, obviously all of this, all these items are important, but I would encourage everyone to stay at least through the process and timeline for 1920 budget reductions and possibly longer if, if, if you can, but certainly for the LCAP and the budget as those are um, sort of foundational documents that uh, direct the uh, actions of this district, certainly for next year, but also years to come after that. And now for the highlight of the night, we'll do the trivia question. So this is something that we've been doing for six months. Um, we, uh, are they in the back as well? Awesome. Um, for everyone here who wants one. Uh, we usually do a couple of agenda items and then we offer the audience here to respond to um, uh, if they think they know the answer. Uh, then we go to uh, email. If you have an email uh, answer, you can email it to us at trivia at berkeley.net. Otherwise, we go to the Twitter sphere. Um, and if you get the correct answer, you receive a small prize. But this does, excludes uh, administrators and board members from receiving a prize. And the intent here is to engage and educate members of the, pub of the public. OK. No worries. All right. So the question for today is, so nope, there you go. Mm, go back to one more. Thank you. Okay. So uh, as we all know, it's the role of the school board to set policy for a school district. Um, us, our board, we like all school boards, we do this through the adoption of board policies. Um, directors um, Al uh, Alper and Liva Cutler uh, serve on our policy committee. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Berkeley School Board also adopts board bylaws. And those board bylaws govern the actions and responsibilities of the board and individual board members. So we have five requirements that are found in our board bylaws. Okay? One of them is inaccurate. Which one? Pay attention. Pay attention. So I figure this is the last board meeting of the school year. This is for us. So one, the board may limit public comment to only matters that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Two, the board must publish a notice of a special meeting at least 24 hours before the meeting is noticed to begin. Next slide. A single board member can only talk with one other board member regarding an issue coming before the board. The board must review the district's conflict of interest code in odd numbered years. And each board member must file a statement of economic interest by April 1st of each year. <laughs> so one of those statements, responsibilities, is inaccurate. It's a former city clerk. <laughs> All right. So think, don't cheat, and go on gamut and find the answer. You won't be able to anyway. Um, all right, that's the trivia question for today. We will get to it after both LCAP and budget items are done. The next item on the agenda is 30 minutes for public comment. I don't think we'll need that given the, the turnout tonight. Um, three minutes each. We've already explained the process for public comment. Um, for some reason, if you did not get a chance to speak enough, you can come uh, wait till the end of the meeting and there's another opportunity to speak um, at, to us at that point as well. Um, I apologize in advance if I pronounce anyone's name incorrectly. Uh, we don't typically, excuse me, we don't respond directly to comments or questions made during public comment. Uh, board members, the superintendent, and staff do take notes during public comment and may follow up with the speaker after the meeting. Um, following the public comment period, there is a period on the agenda during which board members and the superintendent 
have a few comments to make our own comments, have a few minutes, excuse me, to make any comments about whatever we would like. It's at that time that the board can choose, uh, board members can choose to respond to something said uh, in public comment or make any other comment that they wish. We have found that this process keeps our meeting, meetings running smoothly, allows for a maximum amount of people to speak during the 30 minutes a lot of our public comment, and it ensures compliance with the Brown Act, which does not allow for board discussions about items not placed on the meeting agenda. Lastly, I'd like to remind all speakers that there are children in the audience. They may also be uh, listening or watching at home, so please keep that in mind as you speak. If you have complaints about specific district employees, we encourage you to take advantage of our formal complaint process rather than use public comment for that purpose. Again, please remember that anything you say is being broadcast live and will be archived online forever. We have two cards today. So we will go with Jim Lutz, followed by uh, Chinika Gunn. Thank you. Good evening. Mr. Lutz, I'm sorry. Is, is the mic on? Is the mic on? There we go. There we go. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Jim Lutz. I'm the father of Cecilia Lutz, who was in room 204 at Cragmont this year. As I'm sure you may all recall, we had some significant behavioral issues in that classroom this year uh, that resulted in two students, both girls, leaving the classroom. One of those students actually left the school due to harassment by other students in that same class. More generally, that classroom suffered from an unacceptably high number of disturbances and distractions throughout the year. It was a, it was a problematic class. I've been in the district for several years. I have three kids in the schools. It was a, it was a problem class by any standard in this, in this district, from what I can tell. There seemed to be two principal failures on the part of the BUSD with regard to that classroom. First was the placing of multiple special needs children with significant behavioral challenges in one classroom with no aid and no support to the, to the teacher, which quite predictably got out of control. And then the second failure was to, when that issue came up, was to deal with that in an effective and timely manner. When it became apparent that there was a significant problem in that class, it took months to deal with it. The failure to respond compounded the original problem significantly and ended up involving many parents coming here to speak at board meetings, writing dozens of emails, filing complaints, taking up the time of the teacher, the principal, several members of the board, and many staff at the BUSD, as I'm sure many of you can recall. It could have and should have been handled better. And I know issues related to special needs, the step special needs program, special needs students are very complex and challenging. I wanted to just come today and try and make a couple observations and suggestions that came out of that experience to, uh, in, you know, in the interest of if similar issues arise in the future, which it seems like they do, to, a couple of suggestions to maybe help deal with those better. First one is better communication is needed on the part of the BUSD in these situations. The failure of communication on the part of the school and the BUSD made this into a much bigger problem than it ever needed to be. Uh, if they communicated better from earlier on, uh, there would have been much less gossip and confrontation and so much time consumed by everybody. It would have been a much simpler problem had it been dealt with more quickly. And the second one uh, is that it seemed as if the full inclusion policy, you know, it's obviously a very admirable policy. I think people in the district support the goals and the mission of the policy, but the policy, um, uh, it, you know, it seems to have inevitable problems. If you have a policy like that, you're going to have these disturbances in the classroom. There ought to be some type of protocol or response system that exists within the special needs program to deal with these, pro these problems. It's really for the benefit of everyone involved, including, most importantly, the special needs kids. I mean, it takes... It, 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 over the course of this school year, those, ch those children's needs were not being met whatsoever. And if they'd just been some way for the parents to know, how do we ask for help and someone we could speak with to get that help more quickly and more, in a more responsive fashion, uh, then the entire school year could have been salvaged in a way that it would have been much better for everyone involved. But uh, hopefully, if there's going to be reforms to the, to the special ed system this year, those considerations can be taken into account. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Sneak a gun. Thank you. I do have to respond that I wrote down notes from what you said, and you said the inclusion policy causes problems. I am here because Berkeley states in many forms through your, your marketing, your mission statement, 
things I've seen around town, that Berkeley is inclusive, but actually, actually it's not, not for people that look like me. Some of you recognize me, some of you don't. I came here tonight, I didn't plan on it. As you can see, my family didn't quite plan on mommy being here, but I could not afford to wait until school started to share with you my concerns. On June 25th, I visited the admissions office. I had one goal and one purpose. I want my address to be corrected. I've submitted all forms that have been required of my family and I, and each year my family and I go through this process. My son Malachi, attending Craigmont, great experience at Craigmont, we came here as a homeless family. Homeless, broken, and alone, we were assigned to Craigmont. Every year we go through the process of asking for permission to continue to stay there. And Malachi, my son, has found a lot of support at Craigmont, and that's where we wish to stay. So again, my purpose in being in the office, to get our address corrected. Our mail is being sent to a place that is not safe. Each time this district send my private information to my old address, you are putting the lives of me and my small children in danger. I only had one goal, please correct the error. I offered advice. It's important that you look within the way you operate here and ensure that no other family feel the way that I do. No family should feel that they're a school district. It's putting their lives in danger. Rather than correcting the error, they went into the blame game. They spent about three minutes of my time searching through papers and files to see if it was me who caused the error. They said, see, you wrote it here, you've got the address. And I also told them I was here June 14th, 2017 to get this corrected. They didn't. For the whole year, my daughter's report card and any information that pertains to her education within this district has been sent to the wrong address. I'm running out of time, but you need to hear this. What happened next was the most frightening, worst experience I've ever had in this school district. About an hour after my visit, I received a call from Francisco Martinez. And if I can imagine what Francisco was doing, he was frantic. He was frantic and trying to dig up any information about me to paint me as something I am not, an angry, erratic black woman. That was his goal. His goal was to not correct my address. His goal was to intimidate, retaliate, and exclude. I'm going to continue. I'll stop when I'm done. I'm sorry, Ms. Gunn. It's three minutes for every speaker. I apologize. And that's why I sent the email before I got here. Uh, Ms. Hemphill, I look forward to speaking with you. Good. Thank you. And it, it, you feel free to contact all of us if, if you like. Um, I look forward to the email to all of you. OK. Thank you. Thanks for your time. So that now concludes the public comment period. Uh, thank you very much for everyone who came to speak. If you did not get a chance to speak or uh, speak enough, you can uh, again say to the end of the meeting and speak, or you can email us directly um, at boardofed at berkeley.net, or you can contact us individually. Our information is posted online at berkeley.net slash school dashboard. Uh, now there is an opportunity to hear from our unions. Each union has five minutes to address the board on issues of its choosing. Ms. Campbell. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Evans. <clears throat> My name is Kathy Campbell. I'm the president of the Berkeley Federation of Teachers. I'm here tonight to speak about item number 17, the BUSD hiring process. Um, I want to speak tonight to urge this board to um, continue to engage with this topic. And I urge you to ask for another update in September. Um, I want you to know that from the point of view of BFT, we do not yet see the sense of urgency about this issue that we think is appropriate to the task. Um, people may realize, I'm sure, that we're operating in a very tight labor market. It's very competitive. Um, we are you know, competing for talent, and we want the highest quality teachers we can possibly get for our students. 
And so this is really fundamental to our whole mission, right? We're a people business. That's what we do. We provide the right people to students and families. So hiring is, is our thing, right? We don't produce anything. We're not a factory. We don't have a product. We try to get the right people in the room with students and families to achieve our goals. So I want to urge this board to try to create a greater sense of urgency around this issue. And I will tell you why I feel that way. There has been some progress, and I think you will see that in the report tonight. But from our point of view, it is not uh, commensurate to the importance of the task. So for example, this year we began the process of rehiring our temporary teachers, um, which is a large number of teachers. It's upwards of 50 or more teachers each year. Um, we started that process in early May. That was better than 2017, but the same as 2016. So what we achieved was we got back to where we had been two years ago. We did not actually make progress compared to 2016. Um, in addition, we need to hire about 60 new teachers. That's pretty average for us. Um, so far, we've signed two of those 60 teachers to a contract. The rest, the other 58, will not be signed until next Tuesday at the earliest. And that day will probably be about 10. That seems to be our capacity. And so it will take uh, through the beginning of August to sign uh, those teachers, or it could possibly take that long. Um, any one of those teachers, none of them are bound to us, any one of those teachers could sign a different contract in a different district tomorrow. So they may have told us they're coming, but they're not bound to come here. And they may be frustrated by the fact that they cannot come. They literally are not invited to come until July 3rd at the earliest. And not all of them have been invited for July 3rd. So we're playing with fire a little bit. Um, and many districts around us are, have completed their hiring process months ago. Um, there's been no change from our per perspective in the past 12 months in terms of the use of technology in this process. There's some Google Docs but um, we have not made significant progress. And I want the board to know that I think, and I'm sure you, maybe you'll hear this from your staff, I encourage you to ask them what would be required to make greater progress and to do it more quickly. I think you're gonna have to invest some money. And I really recommend that you ask your staff for a specific proposal. What would you need to use technology in the way that other districts around us are using technology? What are the barriers to online onboarding? What are the barriers to being able to actually know where a PR is? Right now we do things with paper. And papers get lost, and people don't know where they are. They're literally, they can't be found. So what would it take to move away from paper and be able to bring ourselves to the level that districts near us are at? I want to specifically call out, oh, I've lost track of time, that we are not going to be able to significantly change the number of teachers of color in our district until we tackle this. We're hiring teachers in July and August. And we will not make a significant difference until we address that. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, district committees? All right, board members. Anybody? Yes, this is just in relation to the comment that from the parent in terms of um, the address. I hope that this is followed up with by the superintendent in, re in regards to admissions. I think this is very important. I don't, I like to think it's isolated, but it might not be. And it should, I think it's something serious that uh, other families have also in the past complained. And so, I, I would hope that there is a report back to the, in terms of how this is being addressed. Um, my next office hours will be on August 20th. That's all. I did have another comment. Um, 
And this is about the, the families being reunited with their children. I hope that more family members and community and our staff and our teachers, I think all of us in our school district care about these children and these families that are being separated and they will all take action somewhere, sometime, um, contribute, donate, uh, protest. But this is something that impacts all of us. Right now it affects young children and families and I, we, none of us can imagine how this is painful. Um, and unnecessary. So I hope we all take action. So only because it is her last board meeting <laughs> am I going to go back in the agenda and give five minutes of time <laughs> to Ms. Paula Phillips, the president of BCCE. Thank you, President Daniels. Um, I just want to say good evening to our, oh my God, I'm just losing myself. <laughs> Um, good evening, school board members, and to our listening public. As Director Daniel said, today is the last day you'll hear me say I'm the president of the Berkeley Council of Classified Employees. Um, as president, I've worked tirelessly to represent the classified workers of Berkeley Unified School District for the past 10 years. And as I reflect over the past 10 years, it seemed as though there were never enough hours in the day, nor enough days in the week to do what I believe needed to be done for our members. I went from learning systems myself to building systems for our members. I learned how things worked by creating, building, and utilizing relationships in meaningful ways. Along the way, some were broken, and it was through self-reflection that the pages were turned where I had the opportunity to mend those broken relationships and utilize them in meaningful ways. As a public servant and union activist, I am proud to say that I have stood shoulder to shoulder with our members over the past 10 years to ensure that they have wages, benefits, retirement security, and a voice on the job. I have lobbied for and supported legislation that supported our public schools and the students, families, and communities we serve. And I hope our members have learned how to advocate for themselves along the way. By and large, the big takeaway is that I cared for people. I cared about the livelihood of our members, their working conditions, collegial relationships, and what's best for student achievement. And while I thought today was gonna be just me saying goodbye and thank you for all of the support along the way, um, the Janice decision came about. And in the face of Janice, which has nothing to do with free speech rights, and everything to do with limiting the voice of classified workers, teachers, and other school employees. Yeah. It is the same voice we use to educate our nation's children, and the same voice we use to advocate for our public schools and the students we serve. The decision is a direct threat to our ability to advocate for the pay, benefits, and working conditions that we need to get our important work done. By seeking to eliminate our ability to advocate for our jobs and our, and our institutions, the case is also a direct threat to our public education system and the students and families that we serve. As a union of classified workers, we know how essential our work is to the success of our students. We believe our students and their families deserve a living wage affordable health care, decent housing, safe and clean neighborhoods, and the right to live free from fear. We are fiercely dedicated to our students, passionate about the work we do as classified employees, and always up to the challenges that we face. So with that being said, we have work that needs to be done in the days, weeks, and months to come, and years to come. And I just want to say that it's been a wonderful ride. <laughs>
And just know that I'm only gone for now, but not gone forever. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. All right, back to board member comments. Well, first of all, I want to congratulate Ms. Phillips on her 10 years of representing our classified staff. Um, she, you have, uh, I don't want to say worthy opponent because that sounds a little bit more antagonistic than I want to be. I would say you're a fierce advocate for your members. And, um, and I, and I um, whoever, and the person replacing you will have large shoes to fill. So um, we'll probably not be seeing you around as much, but hope to still see you around. I also just want to make a comment um, to um, echo what uh, Director Levia Cutler um, had to say, is I often hear complaints um, from about our admissions office, and I would say that some of the staff have a less than what I would call sensitive approach to handling what can be some fragile living situations, and while I understand that it's a difficult position for them to be in, particularly when your job is determining whether or not someone is eligible to reside in the district. I have deep appreciation of, of what you may, as an employee, go through with that job. But having said that, I think we really need to provide some additional professional development about, one, just the various living situations that our families are in the different custody situations that families are in, sometimes formal, sometimes not formal, and to help them to understand that stories that they hear um, are real stories, and they're not stories that are necessarily being made um, to get around our, our rules and regulations around residency. And I think that that would, would go a lot, because I, I do think that some of our employees don't understand the complexity, particularly in the Bay Area, of how custody and um, living situations can be, and that um, they need to be sensitive to that. I will be having office hours the second week of September. Um, however, if anyone does wish to get in touch with me during the summer, um, you can reach me at Karen Hemphill at berkeleynet. Dot, sorry, Karen Hemphill at berkeley.net. Um, it may take me a couple of days to get back to you, but I will, and we can set something up. Otherwise, it'll be in September. And lastly, I just want to again congratulate our class of 2018. It was a pleasure going to what I assume will be my last Berkeley High graduation. I want to thank and congratulate Ms. Phillips on 10 years. Um, Karen said it, but you have, have been a fierce advocate for the district's lowest paid workers, the classified workers who, um, if you, as you have said so many times, really are the backbone of the district. And um, while it's true, as, as Director Hempel also said, we haven't always agreed on every issue, it has, um, it has never been a question in our minds, in anybody's minds, uh, that uh, your loyalty to your members. And um, that will be, um, again, I'm just repeating everything she said, there will be big shoes to fill. And, and we will um, miss you. And we do appreciate your work on behalf of the whole district. So thank you very much. And congratulations. Um, just to echo uh, what my colleague said, Ms. Phillips, um, when I was first elected in 2010, you had already been here for two years. Um, and so it has been my pleasure to work with you for the last almost eight years now. And I just, I just think it's important to recognize, particularly for those who have not served in leadership like you have, that it can be an incredibly isolating, frustrating, demanding, and oftentimes unappreciated role. Um, and, and that... Talking about now? <laughs> talking about Ms. Phillips. <laughs> And, and uh, I, I, think, I think that um, regardless of whether on a particular issue 
there's been agreement or disagreement. The, the, the work necessary to do your role, to represent the needs of your members, is difficult, and you have carried that mantle incredibly well. So just thank you, thank you for that. Unfortunately, I'd like to spend the rest of my comments on, a, on more upsetting and somber news. Um, as some of you know, uh, I'm a lawyer, went to law school, um, and the last couple of days have been very trying as we think about what the law has done to our country and what the law has done to our community. Um, from the Supreme Court upholding the xenophobic travel ban to the Janus decision to the, um, the announcement by Justice Kennedy that he'll be retiring and the prospect of a new Supreme Court justice that this administration would potentially put on the bench. And for me, as someone um, who most of the time believes in the potential of the law and the judicial system, um, to think about, without going into detail, what happened in East Pittsburgh, the long line of things that have happened, um, and the fact that what stopped the family separation policy was not the law, was not a court, but was people organizing and mobilizing in response, and it was only yesterday, after months of families being separated, that a court only then stepped in and said you can't do that. <clears throat> It's just very disheartening. Um, and I just hope that we can find a way, be it through the courts or through organizing or through educating bright young children to become the leaders of tomorrow, that we can do something about that. Because the last couple of days have just been um, incredibly trying and incredibly scary and uh, just, just difficult all around, and not the way that I wanted to sort of end this, this year. So I, I apologize for ending my comments on a note. See, the, it's okay. <laughs> no, she didn't even start my counter. So anyways, I'll end it at that. Um, but I just, I just wish we could end on, a, on a, a better note, but just the past couple of days have not allowed me to do that. And I agree with um, President Daniels. Um, I do want to thank the parents for coming out tonight. Um, it's disheartening to hear um, about your experiences. I, I do want to say that there are many lessons to be learned from the Cragmont situation that we are going back looking at what we could have done differently. Um, we hope that all of our kids' experiences here in the district are positive. And um, when they're not, we do take that personally. And um, as we reflect, and this is something we're doing now, is reflecting on, on our past practices and what we could have done differently. So I want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge um, the admissions office. Um, I appreciate you coming here and um, sharing that experience um, with us. Uh, we are a work in progress. Um, I will find out what happened. I will check into that. Um, and then finally, um, Ms. Phillips, you will be greatly missed. Um, I know we didn't always see eye to eye on many situations, but we always could come to some type of common agreement, understanding about a situation, and um, you made a difference um, in BCCE. And I think that um, you not being the leader will be felt by many, but you did um, bring to the board, to this community, many of the issues um, that needed to be dealt with. And all the issues that came before us, um, we had to deal with them. And I hope that we, or you, uh, feel that you made BCC a better place than when you found it. And I think you did. And I just want to say thank you for that. Okay, we will now move on to the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Motion. Motion by Director Alper. Is there a second? Second, second by Director Leva Cutler. Without objection, <clears throat> consent calendar is approved. 
Moving on to item number 13, action item, local control and accountability plan or LCAP. This is, this item is for, it's an action. Um, we will need to approve the final plan. Um, there were quite a few questions um, that we, um, that the board had um, before us and some of it had to deal with the unspent dollars. And I know we had unspent dollars uh, from, or the governor approved the budget um, late. And so um, we had some dollars that were, um, okay. <laughs> um, so we had some dollars that um, were not um, designated for. Our, and so we're bringing those items back. And so this is a brief um, presentation, no more than a couple of minutes to talk about those unspent dollars and what we're hoping the board to do tonight is just to approve um, this item. And then the next step would be, um, this would go off to um, Alameda County for approval. Yeah. All right, so good evening. Um, I'd like to say good evening to the board. Um, it's been a long um, process of getting to this final approval with LCAP. Um, I did not prepare slides for this evening. I'm just gonna talk us through the final approval. So I'd like to start off, first of all, by saying thank you to the board members, um, to the cabinet members, to the Ed Services staff, and most importantly, to our stakeholders, our parent advisory committee, our educators advisory committee, and our district uh, English learner committee. Um, their input has been invaluable. So this evening, I am asking the board to approve the 2018-19 and 2019-2020 LCAP with the following recommendations. Um, we've added a .6 FTE for additional uh, math support at Longfellow. We've added two a school welfare and attendance specialist that will work with the new manager for the African American Success Project. One of these positions will focus explicitly on students in grades seven and eight, and the second position will focus on students at grades nine and 10. When the governor revised uh, the budget, uh, we received an additional allocation of $12,805 for the 2017-18 school year. This was late in May, and we were not able to um, determine an expenditure that late in the year. Um, however, we have allocated that funding um, for the 18-19 school year. Um, we've increased, our recommendation is to increase the mental health contracts for the 11 K-5 schools. Currently, they receive $12,000 a year. We're uh, recommending an increase to $13,000 a year. And um, then that would leave $805. And our recommendation is that we allocate that funding to support us in creating a progress monitoring system for our McKinney-Vento students, which is in alignment with the recommendations from Alameda County, as we are a district that is currently under technical support. We know that moving forward for the 18-19 school year, we will have additional funding, um, unspent funds. We know that we will have um, 125,000 from the African American success position that we did not fill this year, 23,000 for Berkeley High School math support, and then an additional $19,000 that was um, allocated to us from the governor's uh, May revised budget. Which, is, which totals 167,000. There may be additional resources once we close the books um, at the end of this school year. So I can talk to you a little bit about our process um, of how we're gonna allocate the unspent funds, but I, I'm gonna stop and take your questions about the current LCAP plan that's being uh, presented tonight for approval. Any questions, yeah. comments? Trying to make this quick. Uh, so I had a question about um, the funds for McKinney-Fendo students. Um, I absolutely agree with providing more support for our students experiencing homelessness, but I am, um, but I would like a little bit more information about, well, let me back up. 
when we were looking at budget reductions recently, there was about, I think, $60,000 of McKinney-Vento funds that we repurposed because every year we, 50? 50. 50. Uh, because every year we've underspent about $10,000 a year and so a fund balance had, had um, accumulated. Had accumulated. And I think part of why we made that decision was at the time we were expecting that our McKinney-Vento grant would continue and we would continue to underspend it. But in fact, my understanding is we we are not going to be getting that grant going forward. And while I understand that since one would assume that home, most, if not, well, given the Bay Area, you could probably not be low income and still be homeless, but um, that many of our homeless student, students experiencing homelessness would qualify under low income, um, that I don't know if the academic, academic support type of programs that are funded by LCAP would replace the kind of more direct services that in many ways were being given through McKinney-Vento, things like transportation costs, you know, those kinds of things, you know. Um, and so I'd like to know a little bit more about how are we going to replace the, you know, is there, are there needs that cannot be met with LCAP that used to be met with McKinney-Vento? And also, to some degree, by now repurposing, which would our next agenda item, repurposing or you know letting those funds drop to the fund balance because they have not been used. Well, now that means we have no categorical funds, so to speak, just to provide support for our students experiencing homelessness. Yeah. So currently, we provide funding through Title One A. Um, for our McKinney-Vento students. We um, provide um, funding for transportation, BART and AC transit um, passes, as well as um, um, clothing and personal hygiene needs um, for our McKinney-Vento students. Um, this afternoon I looked at the grant, um, and the grant that we did not receive funding uh, for primarily paid for the one-to-one -one tutoring for our McKinney-Vento students. And I think that this should be a priority as we do our Title I allocation for the 18-19 school year. And um, in just taking a quick look at the budget, I think that we could allocate about $15,000 additional through Title I for um, this population of students. So that will cover um, the loss of funding in the grant. And those Title I funds can be used at the high school? They because can be used for homeless students. Okay, because I know it doesn't Berkeley matter High is not are. a Title That's I, correct. but we, many are, are at the high school, okay. Yes. Um, I Just a question in terms of what does the math support look like at, at Berkeley High, I imagine? What, what does that mean? Uh, so the new math support or the math support we weren't able to um, cover this year? The math support that you weren't able to cover this year? So our plan was that we were gonna hire a teacher, point two, that would actually go into the math one classes where the 10th graders were, are currently taking it for a second time and we were not able to find a teacher to do that. Mm -hmm. Not at all, okay. Since it was raised, I was gonna keep this to the second half, but I'm e extremely concerned about um, math support. You know, my understanding is that there'll be very few students that were identified as um, receiving particularly Ds that will be served. Um, and that at this point, and that those students that are not rising seniors um, will not be receiving credit recovery as part of summer school, which may account for some of the low enrollment. I mean, it would be difficult for me as a student to spend a few weeks in summer school and just repeat the course all over again in the summer. Uh, it's not the motivation that most students have at that age. So I am concerned about what we're doing for credit recovery for those uh, uh, incoming 10th graders that they're now behind um, in terms of keeping up with the credits per year in math. And I'm also concerned that we will now have a lot of students returning who got Ds and even Fs who will not have had the opportunity to reinforce or augment those skills during the summer. So I do know that there was a Saturday program this year that was, I guess, kind of pulled together with bits and pieces of funding, not necessarily even district funding. 
that seem to be fairly successful from what I've been hearing. So I understand that we'll be hearing about the process, but for me, um, supporting st our students in math has got to be one of our major priorities. Um, you know, last year, or this current, well, this last school year, um, of the students who had failed Math 1 as ninth graders that were repeating Math 1 as 10th graders, 65% failed again. So if the plan is that, that those students are not receiving anything over the summer, and then they're gonna be put back in Math 1 again with the same teaching, um, you know, the same pedagogy, pedagogy going mm -hmm. on, you know, nothing of changed. You know, what they say is the definition of insanity. You know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So I see no reason not to believe that 65% will fail again. So I really see this as a crisis, and I don't know what the process was. I guess you'll hear that, but I'm hoping it's a process that could result in us having something, you know, in September for our students. Okay, other comments? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So the process will be that um, Ed Services will take a look at all of the end of the year data. We will have a conversation um, and look at, and talk with folks at the high school as well as the elementary and middle school math coaches. And um, we will come back with a recommendation for new actions or services that explicitly target our unduplicated students um, in August. I also will take it to the stakeholders as soon as I can convene them, which may not be until the first week of September. And we'll come back for final approval. And math is, I would say, our top priority. Um, we've looked preliminarily at the data. Um, and also, this was a priority for our uh, Parent Advisory Council, as well as DLAC. Uh, we had many conversations around the needs for our students around math. And will that include the assessment of any student that's C or below, just to make sure that we are tailoring whatever, you know, what the program is, so that we are, you know, specifically looking at, you know, those areas where they need support, as opposed to just throwing them in a regular math class and expecting that yes. you know, they're gonna do better the second time. So we piloted a progress monitoring tool in math at our three middle schools this year, and Maggie texted me about an hour ago and said that she talked with all of the principals this, after, this morning at principals meeting, and they're all interested in doing the progress monitoring for math. It monitors uh, progress on the California Common Core standards, and so we will screen all of our students um, in September at the end of first semester and in the spring to look for progress um, on the standards. We will tailor our interventions based on the data that we receive from the fall um, initial screening, and we will push that into the high school. We need okay. money. Questions? No? Okay. Um, so, no? It, I mean, it's, just, just, it's just that things just take so long. So, the, um, you know, to Director Hempel's point, I mean, the, if the stakeholder groups have already, already identified math as They identified two areas, math and mental health. So, and we're talking about spending the unspent funds, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess I would just urge us to um, do this as quickly as possible. So if it's in that we don't, I'm not sure I have to review whether we need to according to our policy, but it seems to me if, they, if the stakeholder groups are already on board with these priorities and staff identifies in August a way to spend the unspent money that's consistent with the priorities that the stakeholder groups have already identified, um, and it can get to the board even one or two or three meetings earlier, and so we speed could, up the hiring. It just seems like we should do it because we know that otherwise, we're, otherwise this money that we're talking about, it's not gonna be spent until January. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. So if you give us direction, we will uh, meet this summer um, in the month of July and try to identify what the new action and services will be and we can give you an update in August. And if it means hiring additional staff, if you give us that direction, then I think we could you know, move forward. I mean, I, I would love the money to be able to be spent if, if staff knows what it, how to spend it, you know, as soon as the semester starts. So if we can approve it on the first board meeting, 
then I, I would feel comfortable doing that. I think the stakeholders have weighed in, and, and the stakeholders would not want us to delay the implementation. Okay. Any objections? Okay. Any other comments? Okay. I'll add one thing before I'll, I'll move the item. Um, this is more of a, I don't know, general statement. So when we were um, doing budget reductions, uh, we were talking about the $50,000 from McKinney Vento. Um, mentioned that we might be wanting to add more money to that after we were cutting it, and that seemed kind of weird. That the result of that was basically you're just, you're, you're supplanting. So the beneficiary of those dollars is not actually the students who are homeless because it's actually the other students, which obviously we all need, but so I just, it is frustrating that that, that has come to pass and that we are basically supplanting general fund dollars plus supplemental dollars um, through this route. So you, you seem that, does that not, did I, did I get that wrong? No, um, okay. because we've never had a system to progress monitor them. So what we allocated funding for was to create a system mm -hmm. to identify the needs for those students. So I don't view we that could as have supplanting. Spent the the, the $50,000 that we cut, we right. could have so spent we're gonna, on that. But we're gonna pick that up with Title I funding, not with yeah, so, so, so again, so that Title I funding then is Title I funding that is being spent on something that the general fund was originally covering. No, what I'm specifically speaking about is covering what was funded out of the grant that we did not receive. Fair enough, but the $50,000 of the general fund that we cut could have been used to cover that. That's correct. So. The tutoring. Whatever it is we're funding. Okay. And I, 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 all I'm saying is that we have whatever the funding sources were for our homeless students. A portion of that was funded out of the general fund. Mm -hmm. We reduced that general fund contribution by $50,000. We are now increasing contribution towards the cost of homeless students from other pots, Title I, mm -hmm. supplemental dollars. So that the overall pot, whatever that change is, is that we wouldn't have had to do that from Title I or supplemental funds as much if we didn't cut the $50,000. And so what that means is that the cut to the general fund is being backfilled by Title I and supplemental dollars, which is what I didn't want us to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand the situation. I'm obviously, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a thing, but I don't want to let it go unnoticed that what we were worried about has come to pass. So it would have been, my, my opinion, it would have been easier for us not to have cut the $50,000 found something else, if we could have, to reduce, and then saved the Title I dollars yes. and the supplemental dollars for other, for, for things that we also know are needed. So that's my statement. Thank you for listening. And now I will move the LCAP. Is there a second? Is it, it is it eighteen hundred? Hundred and fifty dollars. The only sub, the, sub, the amount of supplemental dollars that Dr. Sadler's talking about is eighteen hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Every penny counts. Okay. No, it's not that much money. But it is Title I. But, but I mean. Well, there's not the same non supplanting. There's no non supplanting the restriction on LCAP, on supplemental funds. You, oh, can, you can supplant. Oh. It's just, there's, no, there's nothing illegal it's about it. Yeah. It's just that it's not, in my opinion, the, the maximizing the value of the dollars or, or the benefits of those dollars sort of. Net, the net result is not to the students that we want to benefit. It's not that much money. It's, you know, in the grand scheme of things, but it would have been easier had we not cut that money. Dr. Sadler, is there another opportunity this coming year to apply for McKinney Vento funding? The same grant? I'm not sure. I don't think, so. not for this cycle. Or not this cycle, but Maybe for, for the 18, for the 1920 year. Applying 1920 mm -hmm. for 2021. Yeah, that's when yes. they're going to come back out again, and then okay. we'll, it, we'll apply for If it's funded. It. Right. Yeah. We don't know yet. But we, have more we have more lessons learned in terms of how to approach this, I think. All right, so I'll, I'll motion, motion, blah, blah, blah. sorry, LCAP has been made by President Daniels, seconded by Director Alper. Let's do a roll call vote. Director Hemphill. <clears throat> this includes the direction of what to do with the supplemental funds for math. Yes. Then it's yes. Director Leva Cutler? Yes. Director Alper? Yes. President Daniels? Yes. 4 0 with Direct Vice President Appel uh, absent. Thank you very much. All right, next up, item number 14. 
uh, estimated actuals for 17-18 and adopted budget for 18-19. This is an action item. And I know it says 30 minutes, but I think we can do it in 15. We don't think we need 15, no. Let's, let's, let's do 10. I like it. Let's do 10. Board members, we got 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Um, on the 13th of June, I brought the preliminary budget to the board, and we went through in detail in terms of the change from our estimated actuals to our, adopt, our, our preliminary budget. And we also looked at our deficit and we looked at our multi-year plan. And uh, there were no changes. So there were questions and we responded to questions, but the board had no changes. As a result, we're bringing back the preliminary budget for adoption tonight with no changes. And um, if the board has questions, I'll be happy to answer them. But Essentially, there are no changes to the presentation that I had on the 13th. Were there, um, the governor's budget that was adopted today, will it require a 45-day? Um, I'll have to um, get the details. I'm going to a, um, a conference where we'll get the actual details from school services. And at that point, we'll just determine whether there is a need for a 45-day revision. And the 45-day revision does not require a special board item. We can Put post it. Um, a public posting is what's required. So we can post it on the website and meet the requirements for the 45-day. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> Five seconds. It is an action item. Um, I, I will move to approve and adopt the 2018-19 budget. I will second. This is your first official budget vote as an assistant superintendent, I believe. Yes, well. All right, let's do a roll call vote. Director Hempel. Yes. Director Leva Cutler. Yes. Director Alper. Yes. President Daniel. Yes, for nothing with Direct Vice President Appel not being here. Okay, if anyone would like to uh, read the budget, I've memorized it already, here you go. <laughs> All right, uh, now, even though we're like, we're working, we're, we're good, I'm gonna do the trivia question. <laughs> so, do you wanna do our banana break? No, let's go. Let's keep going, okay. We're on a roll. We're on a roll, all right. Now this might make us not on a roll, depending on how we answer this question. So as a reminder, uh, the trivia question asked about various requirements under our board bylaws. Um, Go forward. So we have five requirements. Um, the first one is that the board may limit public comment to only matters that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. The board must publish a notice of special meeting at least 24 hours before the board meeting is noticed. Next slide. Single board member uh, can only uh, talk with one other board member regarding an issue coming before the board. The board must review the district's conflict of interest, interest code in odd number of years, each board member must file a statement of economic interest by April 1 of each year. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> okay, before I show, anyone of the public here would like to guess at which one? And no, no email? No email. All right, let me just hop onto the Twitter sphere since I, I usually get thousands of tweets on this sort of stuff. Natalie's really missing out on this one. It doesn't look like it. Okay, anybody? Do you want me to live tweet this instead of her? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Would you like to, like to answer? Yeah. Go ahead. The first one? Go to the next one, Liz. Next slide, please. Okay, very slowly. Press one to the right. Okay, the first one is true. Good guess though, young man. Um, so it is true that the board can limit the uh, public comment 
to only matters that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board, but that is really broad. <laughs> so it's actually not that much of a limitation. Um, so that is true. Anyone want to guess whether the second one is true or false? It is, it is both. That is a good distinction, uh, Director Hemphill. So it is part of the Brown Act. Um, a special meeting versus a regular meeting. So this is a regularly scheduled meeting. This is a 72-hour requirement. A special meeting is a 24-hour requirement. So that is true. Next slide. Okay. How about this one? A single board member can only talk with one other board member regarding an issue coming before the board. It is true. So there is, uh, we, a majority of this board cannot talk, not in public, not at an agendized meeting, about any item coming before the board, uh, a majority. So that means basically three of us. But Director Hempel and I can have all the conversations we want about a single item. But as soon as I talk to Director Leva Cutler about it, that becomes technically an actual meeting that was not noticed and therefore violates the Brown Act. Okay, how about this one? Each board member must file a statement of economic interest by April 1st of each year. For the, for the preceding year. For the subs, yeah. So, for example, on April 1st of 2018, <laughs> I, we all had to file an SEI, or Form 700 it's called, for the 2017 calendar year. Yeah. It is true. All right, so Director Alper, this applies to our policy subcommittee. <laughs> the board must review the district's conflict of interest code in odd numbered years. I think it's even. That is false because, it, Director Hemphill, even. it is even numbered years. I'm a retired city clerk, you guys. <laughs> so it is an even numbered year. You'll have to go back and check the minutes. <laughs> so now that we are all educated about our bylaw responsibilities, um, I thought that was a good one to, to, to end the year. So um, we will continue to have fun with this um, in the fall. That's good. That's good. All right. Thank you very much. So moving on now to process and timeline for 1920 budget reductions. Return, so we're we'll bringing this item to the Return of the Pauline. Yes. Um, and our Assistant Superintendent Pauline will um, talk about the timeline. The board gave us direction at our last board meeting um, to come to return with a timeline and a process um, that would culminate the recommendations um, to the board for our ongoing budget reductions um, for 1920. So again, this will be a pretty brief um, item. Um, the board, uh, when we met la at, at the June 13th meeting, we were asked to come back with a board item that allowed us to approve up to $2 million in budget reductions and the process that would, um, would be involved. So the board cover kind of went over um, the, the timeline in terms of the meetings with the SBAC. So the first slide um, kind of talks a little bit more about our SBAC. Um, who, who are they and what, what does it consist of? And then who are, who are actually on um, the SBAC and what's their, what's their um, role? And then exactly how often do they meet? So this is just a really quick background in terms of the superintendent's budget advisory committee. And then in terms of the process and the timeline, um, in September, um, our superintendent will select members to serve on the SBAC, and we'll convene the meetings um, in September. And we'll have about six public meetings in the fall and the winter. And we, our, um, we have to ensure that the recommendations are made to the board before March 15th, and that would be um, recommendations for budget reductions. So again, um, we are being asked to formally, the board's being asked to formally approve 
and direct the superintendent to lead a process that will eliminate, um, that will culminate in recommendations presented to the board no later than March 15th of ongoing budget reductions up to $2 million for the 1920 unrestricted general fund budget. Questions, comments, go ahead. So this seems to be pretty much the same timeline that we've used for the past, since really the SBAC has convened. Correct. Um, and I just wanna um, give appreciation to um, our finance department and our superintendent for putting this process together. Uh, I think it's been said by many of us board members in the past, unlike many districts, you know, our budget process by the time it gets to the board it's an audience like this. Mm -hmm. That's not true in many, many, many districts. And I think it says a lot to this process. And so I am in absolute support of it um, and uh, really see it as a shining example of open and transparent government um, in terms of what our district does. Similar comics, Dr. Um, Dr. Hempel. <laughs> <laughs> um, board Member Hempel, um, I, I think this process is also very, has been very transparent and open. Um, and given that we will be having in uh, December two new board members, one of the things mm -hmm. I was thinking about is how maybe do we call, three. maybe, well, okay, <laughs> but <laughs> hopefully two, um, that we can um, codify this schedule alongside what the this, this district staff are doing and what the board meetings that we have to have around it so that we have four new board members, um, a real schedule in terms of how we see this happening. So I think that that would help in terms of alongside the aspect mm -hmm. what they're doing in the public meetings, what else so we're doing as a board in terms right. of uh, discussing what district staff are doing in cabinet. Um, so it's just bringing that all together so it's not sitting in somebody's head and then everybody's finding out, but it's up front in terms of our process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great point because the, if the recommendation, if the final thing is for the recommendation to come to board at, in March, right. presumably they will have come before the board earlier for public Correct. vetting and the board vetting. Um, mm -hmm. I guess my question is about the target. It's not clear to me what, up to, I know we said it last time, but it's not clear to me what up to $2 million means. And what we did last time was, last year, that for this year, was to set a very specific um, target of $1.8 million in cuts with an additional identified $300,000 in cuts. So mm -hmm. um, a target of 1.8, but identified cuts of 2.1. Am I getting, is that right? Um, so um, it seems to me we should we should try to give pretty specific direction. Well, I think we'll have more um, information once we close the books, so we'll see what the ending fund balance is that, in, that will okay. impact our beginning fund balance. And I think we chose $2 million because we felt that's the amount that would lead to a balanced budget where we actually might not be deficit spending as much as we were in the past and lead to a sustainable ending fund balance. So I guess I would I would suggest that we um, amend the the action to um, to include an action item in August where we actually once we have that information give a specific target number. Does that make sense? So I I would suggest that that we if, if we're as I understood up to two million it was more reference to whether or not the board is committing itself to whereas last year we, we were pretty clear we needed to we needed to cut one point eight. Um, at least, um, this, as I, as, as I, as I sort of was was understanding it from our last conversation, was that we're going to get a list of two million dollars of cuts, but the distinction is that the board is not committing itself to that cut target, mm -hmm. so that the SBAC comes up with that amount of cuts, but that the that the cut target is not a full two million necessarily. It's, it's a little bit more fluid. Oh, right. um, my my worry is that whatever number we say be it 2 million, be it 2.5, be it 1.5, that's the ceiling. There's no way it gets higher than that. Just, it just won't happen. Mm -hmm. And my, my strong suggestion, given that I will not be on this board when this vote is happening, um, would, would be to maximize our flexibility throughout the process. 
And so that means maintaining this as the amount of, of potential cuts that this board could make, regardless of what small changes the governor's budget allows us to make. Because we don't know what needs might arise between now and March 15th of next year. And we, in theory, the board could cut zero. But if a board, if, 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 we, if we reduce this to 1.5 or to 1 or to 0.5, and the board thinks, huh, we want to, we need to invest in, I don't know, technology to track homeless students, something like that, and we wish we had an additional $100,000 to invest, we're not going to have it because we would not have had the option of that, of that reduction. So I, I would strongly urge us to stick with this $2 million through the entire process at the board's discretion and only the board's discretion could a lower number only and only after the cuts come to the board. Only at that point would the board say, we don't need to go this high, but not before. Because as soon as you say that, it's done. It's not going to happen. That, 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 you, you automatically lower the ceiling. So I, that, that would be my, my strong, strong suggestion for us to move forward with. I won't get into the, my total philosophical disagreement with some of what you have to say, but I will counter that in terms of that would be a ceiling, is I remember when you were probably in elementary school, no, uh, when my children were in elementary school and um, the district said, we're going to have to cut like 50, you know, it was, they were going to give pink slips literally to like 50% of the teachers and like 60% of the teachers at Washington got pink slips. What was very frustrating about that was I knew that the district was not in that severe financial trouble because I paid attention to things. But the truth was the district wasn't sure how much they were going to have to cut. And so they did layoff notices to like the maximum. I actually think that year uh, Alameda Unified literally gave pink slips to every single teacher they had, which in a way I thought was better because then you kind of knew that it was just an exercise. What it did was it caused incredible morale issues and uncertainty at the high school and at, at the school site levels because we were at Washington potentially going to lose 60% of our teaching staff. And my concern is that when you have a higher number than is necessary for positive certification, um, as demonstrated by what we publish, you know, as we know information, then you are potentially causing that kind of uncertainty and fear unnecessarily. Because when I look at what it took for us to get to the 1.8, and the things that we were cutting to get like to the last 100,000 of that, you know, those were issues that you know, people were understandably coming out for because they were concerned. So, and this is a deeper cut than that. So to me is to, to just to create uncertainty and fear um, without a really concrete reason I have some issues with that, but again, I won't be making those yeah. decisions either. I, I appreciate the perspective, Director Hempel, and and I agree with you that 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 at some point too too much. I mean, setting an arbitrary number that is unrealistic is is unnecessarily damaging. One hundred percent. We ended up losing one teacher yeah. in Washington, I, and we were in fear of losing sixty yeah. percent. I will say that one of the reasons why the deadline is March fifteenth is because that is the notice. So. Mm -hmm. So while someone might be worried that they that a program could be reduced, they would actually have they actually would have certainty because the board has a final say on it, and the board would make that determination before March fifteenth. The other thing I'll say is that last year we made one point eight in reductions almost. Mm -hmm. We could have made two point one, and personally, I wish we had. You had made a very brave suggestion, Director Hempel, about reducing some an academic counselor, and I wish in retrospect that I'd supported that, because now we would need to cut less. Right. And and as much as that would have been difficult for the school site, they would have survived it, and they would have found a way to move forward. And I think that I think I think two million is not. A, a crazy number to think about. We know that we have a structural deficit, according to our last projection, of over a million dollars mm -hmm. ongoing. So two million dollars is not is is not 
an, un, an arbitrarily high number. It is a higher number than where we did last year. Um, and it may not be the absolute minimum, but it also means, as we talked before, there's no compensation in 1920 or 2021. There's no um, cushion uh, for any sort of economic downturn. There's nothing in there for new expenditures. Mm -hmm. This year, we approved expenditures of over $100,000 ongoing. Right. That was the bare minimum. We had a big request for more. So I, I guess I, I hear you. I just think that the facts, to me, illustrate that this isn't that a $2 million sort of um, amount is not um, unnecessarily <laughs> unnerving, I guess, uh, you know, again, from my perspective. So um, I actually respectfully disagree. I think $2 million is a lot. When I look at how difficult it was for us to cut last year, um, and to find two million on top of the 1.8, um, even just going through what we have now, um, that has been pretty tough. Um, just myself and our assistant superintendent um, going through these um, possible cuts, um, it will be definitely tough. But I do think that before we wait till March 15th, I almost think after looking at this, um, and I thought about this this weekend, then maybe we should bring to the board um, something earlier than March 15th, because um, two million and waiting that late um, is unnerving to some if you are on that list. And I don't want to put a whole lot of folks on that list unnecessarily, um, because it will create a morale situation um, for the district. Um, so if we're going to change, I prefer not to wait so late, um, bring an item to the board and say, here's where we are. And if the board can change or want to make a change, um, I would like that to be done a little earlier. Um, but I do, um, I do take the charge of two million to be something that we can try to do, but I just I'm just saying it's going to be difficult for us to make that cut. I mean, so I mean I I will say for right now we keep it at at, at this, um, and you know I I think you're right, Superintendent, that that we wouldn't want to wait until just before the 15th. That that just like this past year there would be an update to the board another. Mm -hmm. So that you know, no no one is surprised that everyone sees it coming, um, and to Director Leva Cutler's earlier point, I certainly want to recommend to the school board candidates who are watching that they attend as many of the SBAC meetings as they can, because um, if they were to win, um, then they would be in this situation to make to make these reductions. Um, so this is uh, an action item. I'll I'll make a motion to. To approve it, um, is there a second? I'll second. Second by Director Liva Cutler. Can we just have a little more discussion for a sure. second? Sure. So, I'm, I, I find what both of you are saying compelling, um, and I and I'm and I'm okay with approving the recommendation. Sort of um, the flip side of what you're saying, President Daniels, is. Um, I almost wonder if we need to, and maybe we don't have to do this now. We could do it in August set a minimum target because I hear what you're saying about if we don't, if we bring it down, whatever we set is going to be the ceiling. But without a floor, it, it also enables us to say we're not going to make any cut. There, the, when we set the 1.8 million as a target, we were committing we were going to make that amount of cuts. And we, and we, well, we knew we weren't going to go over it. That was pretty much the floor and the ceiling. Exactly. Um, so this is a different way of doing it, what mm -hmm. we're doing now. It's saying up to $2 million. It's, it's a higher ceiling, but without any floor. And I just, I could also imagine us saying, um, 
SBAC as you go forward. We know that the board is committed to making one million dollars in cuts, and we want you to identify a, a menu of two million dollars. But we are going to make one million dollars because otherwise, it's almost the reverse of what Director Hemphill is saying, which I really I agree with the unnecessary fear and, and and the morale question. But you also don't want people to think that these are not uh, that this is oh yeah we're, this is just an exercise, but the board's really not going to make any of these cuts. So. so Anyway, yeah, I, I think that if you set the minimum, it will it will in practice be the ceiling. That's my concern. That that if that if that if you say we need to do at least a million, there'll be significant pressure to not go above a million. That you'll get a million, which is great, but that there'll be significant pressure not to go above a million. I, I would say that that another approach, without setting floors, but to give structure, might be to ask for. The, the reductions in, in chunks of approximately 500,000. So if the board wanted to make $500,000 worth of cuts, this is what SBAC recommends. Mm -hmm. If the board wanted to make a million dollars, this is what the board, what SBAC recommends. 1.5, this, and then two. So, but, because I think, I think it doesn't um, bring in the, the, the political um, Psychology of like that minimum thing, but it but it allows the SBC to prioritize mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. some sense. So that that I may be yeah. an, an approach without again setting that 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 floor, which I'm a worried would politically become the ceiling. I actually really like that proposal, doing it in the five hundred thousand dollar chunks. Um, that would definitely work for staff. Um, I mean, it, it could be a different chunk, but those seem, you know, given the amount of money we're talking about, that seems to be a, a decent. So is that mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. Okay. You want to uh, amend the motion? Sure. So I'll, I'll I'll make a motion to approve recommendations with the um, adjustment being um, that the they'll make um, ongoing uh, recommendations for ongoing budget reductions of up to two million dollars in five hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollar increments. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that it? Do you want to still second that, Director Leva Cutler? Sorry, we'll second. Okay. Yeah. So, motion by Daniel, second by Leva Cutler. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. That one I'll say aye too. Okay. Thank you, Director. I appreciate the support. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, keep chugging along. All right. Item number 17 update on BUSD's hiring process. Yes, and I'm going to turn this over to our assistant superintendent, Evelyn Bradley. Um, the board asked us to periodically update them or at least bring this item back. We had a, one discussion about our hiring timeline. We actually made changes and we're going to bring to the board, we're going to talk um, or actually update the board on what some of those changes were as um, as of the last time that we spoke. Um, I do want to note, and they will talk about this, um, the online boarding process and automating that um, in, in this presentation as well as um, the teacher of colors, because um, those were some of the things that the board um, had questions uh, around. And so with that, I'd like to turn over that uh, to Evelyn, our assistant superintendent and our director, um, Dr. Brett Daniels. Good evening, board members. Good evening, board. Back in February, we came to the board and we gave a presentation on the hiring timeline. And it's been four months ago, and now that we're here and we're at the end of school, we wanted to share with you what we have done and where we are um, in the process of getting our classrooms filled with teachers. These are our goals that we revisited uh, in February, and they're listed here. One of the main topics that we wanted to uh, discuss tonight is the higher re retention and recruitment of our teachers, implementation of a paperless onboarding process for all BSD new hires. We also want to talk about all HR forms for employees from paper to, to electronic. And uh, again, here is just to talk about some of the uh, recap, the processes and changes uh, to make these goals a reality for the district. Um, 
So I'll just talk through the, the highlights. So in terms of the budget process, uh, we were able to provide our principals the staffing. This is a teacher template um, bullet um, earlier uh, to allow us to bring uh, teachers back. Um, also, uh, meeting with our position control to again determine vacancies uh, so we can post those at an earlier amount of time. Uh, meeting with our uh, teacher recruitment consultant. Um, this was, these were meetings that were with me weekly and also um, she met with principals to look at upcoming openings, potential openings uh, to help us with eligibility list as well as uh, assisting um, principals with uh, creating candidate pools to pull from. Uh, we also met with BFT uh, to talk about getting the permits in on authorized areas. Um, these are areas of need uh, with the increase in PE release periods and science release periods. There was a major concern that those positions would not be filled um, and that we worked with our existing teachers uh, to discuss how they could actually add those authorizations um, to their credential. I mean, what I can report now is the fact that we currently have one PE, uh, excuse me, one science lease period that we're looking for right now of all the elementary schools. I think we might want to add for um, the people that are listening that we had uh, this year have release times for our teachers for next year for all uh, first grade through fifth grade. And so for that reason, we had to post positions for PE for elementary schools and for science. So that was a, um, a task that we were uh, faced with and challenged with with the other hiring uh, pieces that we had for the school year. We, when you said we worked together with BFT, we had to think strategically. Uh, it's really, we're in a, a situation where hiring teachers at, at this time is, is scarce. We have a freeze in teacher hiring and it's hard to get good qualified people. So we worked together with the, um, with TOSIN, who's a teacher of color network, and also with uh, our union president to bring these meetings together to share with our staff to let them know what the requirements were for hiring uh, teachers with a credential that we call a GLAP. And I say that this is something that we that's unique that we have not done before, is we offered to pay a stipend for these teachers, a $100 stipend to help them pay for that certificate so we can get the teachers onboarded for the PE release and also for, um, for science this year. Okay, thank you. And uh, just up to the board, we have approximately four GLAPs in PE, one uh, in science. So we did utilize that. That effort came to support us for next year. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also moved up our rehiring of our current teachers in terms of retaining, retaining our teachers. So uh, essentially 90 teachers were brought back. Uh, these are first year teachers, uh, second year teachers. So in terms of retaining uh, our, our current staff and keeping us whole, um, really happy um, about that. Um, in terms of just looking at the early numbers, um, approximately 30% of those teachers are of color that are uh, coming back. And in terms of our retention, we had, um, I would say a handful or less than 10 teachers of our probes and temps leaving the district. So. Uh, we were able to bring those teachers back and they're coming back next year. Um, again, we're continuing to look at a transition to paperless forms, uh, maybe not for the board or for others, but for our principals. They are submitting their vacancies via um, a, a, a doc, a Google document, uh, allows to track the PRs uh, in terms of having a sense of where the openings are and understanding uh, where uh, that document is in the organization. So we're always able to anchor back and um, know what, where the vacancies are coming from and how the, what fund is coming from. Um, in addition to that, the principals are communicating to us via um, paperless forms uh, in terms of which teachers to bring back. Uh, in the past, it was maybe through email, through paper, but we have a, a document where they can communicate back to us the teachers they plan to rehire to allow us to hire those teachers back and, uh, quickly. 
Uh, another step that we, we've taken is we were able to secure the Classified Pathways Grant. Uh, we've named that BPACT for Berkeley's Pathway for Credentials Teachers to achieve a cred credential teachers, excuse me. And of the 12 recipients uh, that we have, um, we, nine are of color. Uh, these are current employees that are in our district that have worked in Berkeley schools that um, have managed a way to um, um, figure a way out to stay in Berkeley or stay around Berkeley. So in terms of recruitment, in terms of location, I mean, that's something that is a factor. And so we are hoping that will be a pipeline for our district to recruit from within and grow from within. And obviously, uh, these employees um, know the Berkeley culture and we feel they can be successful in the classroom. So those are some changes that we've made. Um, a lot of the uh, classified employees that we have um, that are part of the pathways that we're really proud of, they are IAs, custodians, program um, supervisors. Um, they are coming from all schools, from elementary, middle schools, and they're here to work with us and really passionate about working with our, with our students and, and the population that we serve. And they are, um, we have teachers that, well, soon to be teachers, that are looking to be multiple subject special ed, which special ed, we know this is one of the areas that we um, have challenges recruiting every year. So we're hoping to grow our own. So that's something new that we've done. And we're in close contact with them and making sure that uh, we give them what they need. Um, just recently, we're working with our fellows uh, to get computers so they can go to school and um, getting their fees paid for their tuition. And they're very excited about it. We, so we're, we're really proud of that. Okay, so uh, those are some of the changes, but again, what is the impact? Uh, what do those changes do for us? Uh, so just looking at the numbers um, here, you can see that we have brought back over 95% of our teachers uh, that potentially could apply for other positions or leave the district, uh, but we reassured them that we want them back, brought them in quickly to sign their contracts. And these are our temporary again, and probationary teachers. It uh, also speaks to the notion of retaining teachers. So as these teachers move through uh, their probationary years, they're going to become permanent teachers. Um, also in terms of the onboarding process, in terms of job offers, this year we uh, posted over 100 vacancies uh, this hiring season. Uh, some of those vacancies were filled um, with our temporary teachers. Um, These are additional, uh, yeah. additional vacancies. Uh, yeah. However, for those positions that weren't filled, um, we have over 60 job offers that are out. Um, of those 60 that have, they've accepted, I mean, out many on the onboarding, they've actually accepted. So they're recommended by their principal, reviewed the other credentialing, their recommendations. Uh, we made a job offer, they accepted. They've come in and picked up a hiring packet. And at this point, they're completing those packets. And part of that is a fingerprinting process. So in terms of our uh, onboarding, you know, we, we do, there are some requirements that we have to ensure that the candidates fulfill before we're able to uh, sign them to a contract. It may look in the way of uh, completion of their credential program. It could be they're currently with another district and we need to wait for verification they've been separated from that district before we can, can bring them aboard. And we will begin that process um, next week in terms of signing on uh, these teachers. Uh, in terms of the universal ninth grade, there was to, to support this reform effort. I know that one critical piece was, uh, will it get staffed uh, in time for next year? Uh, Berkeley High has reported to us that uh, all the nine positions in that program are filled uh, and that they're ready to move on for next year. That was another uh, concern uh, that we were able to work with all the departments to uh, allay that, that, that concern. So the Universal Nine has been filled with, uh, we call the U9 with the nine teachers. There was one, I think, transfer uh, within the district that took the, the position. So we're real happy about that. I talked with Erin, she's excited. Um, we also help some of these teachers that are listed here understand uh, the credentialing for physics, especially, I think it was. We had a meeting for them to come down and, and teach them what they needed to do in order to be able to teach um, science. 
the ninth grade. Okay. Um, so just, just looking at it in this uh, chart here, it's actually equal to or greater than 8.0 8 FTE. So just to try to give a, a bird's eye view of the vacancies in the district, actually the elementary number is down to five. We've since uh, the, the preparing the PowerPoint presentation, we were able to fill uh, positions, but um, essentially the high school, uh, just so you know, represents more than Berkeley High School. That would be BIS and also BTA. Um, and some of these positions as well have been through late separations. We have uh, employees that will can separate from the district until June 30th. So uh, in terms of the, the idea of having all the um, positions filled at this point in time, uh, there are some challenges. Um, that would be, for example, even in this last two weeks, we've probably had five or six separations from the district, which then creates a vacancy. Um, so some of the vacancies here are due to uh, separations that we've just had over the past two weeks. Um, in terms of the um, this less than 8.0 uh, .8 FTE, we do have some um, the, the one TK position elementary is a science uh, release position we talked about earlier at the high school. There's some CTE program positions that are um, either 0.2 FTE or 0.4. So just again, to put things in perspective in terms of um, how many vacancies exist from the original over 100 vacancies that we posted during the spring. In terms of our certificated management recruitments, um, we're uh, happy to report that we've completed um, our recruitments. And do you want to speak to those, Ms. Bradley? Yeah, we had um, some openings, as you know, in at the district office. We had our management student service, and we welcome James Wogan aboard. We have uh, Dr. Jan Hamilton for uh, executive special ed director. We've hired her. At the high school, we had um, we had two openings, so we've now have those positions filled. We're in the process of onboarding. We had the BHS math coordinator and also most recently a VP position that has been filled. Um, again, talking about retention, uh, we have uh, retained one of our uh, administrators uh, that will be transferring there. It hasn't made public yet because we haven't made the official sign on, so we'll wait for that. The um, middle school, there wasn't any, and TK, we, there's two, but we actually uh, only have one, which is for the TK um, school. So most of our certificated management have been filled. Correct. And that's the slide here. So the, the high school recruitment for the VP was actually um, filled this week. So we have one certificated position um, open at this time. Um, so in terms of just the next steps, um, what's left, we do have a handful of, of temporary probationary employees to contact to, to sign contracts. We're initiating the um, signing of new hires um, just last, last week. Uh, our goal, we have a lofty goal to have it completed by, um, by July. It's on the PowerPoint is August 2018 to be realistic in case we have, we have situations where we do invite in, uh, teachers to come in, but maybe they're on vacation, so it's delayed. Um, and we will uh, meet our goal of the management recruitment. We have one open. Uh, and then again, to continue to implement paperless systems. So to talk about that, uh, there's a, uh, a program. You can, I just talked about the 56 or 60 job offers that we've made. And the process we have is they re do receive a written uh, offer of employment where they reply yes, uh, they confirm. After they confirm, we invite them in to pick up a hiring packet. And that hiring packet uh, consists of a multitude of forms from government forms, state taxes, uh, to information about our district um, that they need to complete. Uh, what, working with technology, uh, working with the, the Berkeley uh, PC Commission, we've learned that there's a way we can electronically send um, the onboarding packet to the employee, uh, potential candidate, and we can even track where are they in the onboarding process? So have they completed all their forms? Uh, what this advantage will do for us is, um, at this point, we are calling the employees or potential employees and saying, have you completed your packet? You know, are you ready to come in? Some may have 
not started or they may not be ready, we can actually uh, track remotely uh, where candidates are um, on the onboarding process. Uh, and simultaneously, we can also look to see where they are with some of the legal requirements in terms of clearances that we need to look at from our side. Uh, and with that tool, which we plan to pilot in July, we're working with technology, uh, that should streamline the process. So once you receive the job offer and accept from BUSD, we'll send you an email link. And at that point, you can begin to start the onboarding process and we can make sure you can have all your documentation. Uh, it would help us twofold. Number one, it would uh, prop, you know, align with the technology of today. I mean, many of us function online and for most of our lives. Uh, also, in terms of the um, reculturing of the HR office, uh, you know, it would allow us to focus our energy in other areas, uh, opposed to you know, creating packets and having those to, to be picked up and then going through paper. Um, one, one of the things I wanted to share with the board in February, we we talked about laser fish, and that was the first thing about electronics um, that we thought about using. I visited a school district um, in Pleasanton. They use chalk schools. Um, Hayward uses uh, NeoGov. So, you know, we talked about what, what is unique or what is best practices. I think, um, Director Hemphill, you, you'd asked that the last time. And so the best practices that some of the other um, school districts use is using paperless. That's one. And I think that is something that could um, really help. The other best practices that we talk about are signing bonuses. You know, that's that's another thing that I don't know. I've been here for... 11 years and just working at uh, HR for three, I, I don't believe we've ever done that. I think that also is attractive to recruit teachers to come, um, have, a, have a signing bonus. Um, and, and so there's, 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 there's different ways you know, for best practices that, that we think about. And so as we continue to improve our practices and look at ways that we could expedite the hiring process, I mean, at the same time, we want to honor the contracts for um, that we have with our BFT members, with their leaves, they have requests to leave in, in April or February. Um, we have um, reduced workloads, they have until July 15th. Maybe we can think about that as we move forward in negotiations next year, maybe moving up the timeline, but also mean moving these timelines up. So maybe in December, we can start those candidates and pools and know exactly who is gonna be leaving and separating. We can have that information. So we're thinking about these, um, ideas about how we could really implement uh, different ways to be able to move the timeline up rather than waiting, waiting for the budgets to be approved in March, um, looking at um, BSEP fundings to be approved, the general funds, the, you know, the Title IX funds, and, and um, even the teacher template. I mean, this year we got it early this year in March. That was a big deal for us to be able to get that together, working with, um, with our management um, attendance person to be able to get that together. So I think, you know, we're, we're coming a long way. We can improve um, and we're open, um, you know, to suggestions. And then in, in closing, in terms of uh, just looking at ways to streamline our process again, we talked about the onboarding for the employees. However, you know, how um, our current staff works with the current paper that we have mm -hmm. for budgeting. And so looking at a paperless routing system where a manager can initiate the hiring of an employee uh, through uh, digital uh, personnel requests, a pair PR, which could travel to the appropriate offices or uh, desks to get approved through budget and then come to HR. Mm -hmm. So those are the other possibilities that um, our components of NeoGov, they're able to route uh, these PRs that need approval from various departments before we can even post and hire. Um, so that would be um, the next step after um, fine tuning the onboarding process is to looking at how do we route PRs uh, from the site through the district office um, and eventually to hire our employees. And that's the uh, end of our presentation open for questions. Questions? Yes. Go ahead, Director okay. Cutler. Let's go first. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you for this. Thank you for putting this on the agenda. Um, I, I, I agree with what um, 
Ms. Campbell said in her comments about the, you know, the critical importance of what you all do to, to everything that we do in the district, that it doesn't matter what we fund if we don't have the best people in place. And so um, I want to appreciate the, the improvements that we've made and, and they showed up in the, in the presentation that you just gave. Um, and, and to also appreciate the sort of um, um, the steps that you're planning to take to keep, you know, to keep going in the, in the right direction. Um, and so I have a couple of questions. That they, um, the vacancy, the um, the vacancy slides. Those those are not those. A lot of those people are still haven't signed contracts though. Is that right? So we could, um, I guess, Ms. Campbell made this point too. We could lose them at any time, if if other districts have also made them offers. That happened to one of the U nine teachers, right, at the last minute. Um, so is there um, is it the case that neighboring districts have finished their actually had their contracts signed? I know. Uh, we have all we have sixty or so mm -hmm. contracts outstanding. Um, are are there things that other districts are doing? Maybe with maybe it, the the paperless um, system that you just mentioned that enable them to have their contracts signed by June as opposed to, you know, what you said, Mr. Jones, is that we're, our hope is that we'll have them signed by August, mm -hmm. which does seem pretty late. Mm -hmm. um, your question is... I guess, my, is that right that other districts are done um, signing their contracts now? And some, some districts have, and some are still in the recruitment process. Mm -hmm. okay. The teachers that we... And, uh, Dr. Dentley can probably speak more to that because he's in the daily uh, contact with our candidates. The teachers that we put out there that we hire, we give them their contracts. A lot of them are still in the process of just onboarding and they're not filling the contract. They're not ready to come in and just sign their contracts right there and then. So there's pieces that we need to collect from them before we can actually have them onboard and sign a contract. Okay. It could be a number of, of reasons. Um, I can give you a couple. So we have some teachers that we're working with now, um, psych, a school psychologist, for example, uh, entering into MOUs with the universities and signing the MOUs. The individual um, applying and working with the, the um, university to get their intern credential. And once the intern credential is approved and it's online and we can see it on CTC, that gives us a guarantee that they are ready to come and sign. So there's, there's some circumstances um, that we are working with to bring okay. on teachers. But do, do we think that by next year, for example, next year at this time, we'll have this paperless system in place for the onboarding? Mm -hmm. Yes, the I, I believe, yes, and so we're gonna ask for your help. Yes, we're, mm -hmm. we're, that, that we can have this paperless onboarding. And the other piece as well is, I'm not aware, uh, sure if you're aware, is that when we talk with the teachers and we onboard them, we have to make sure they're released from their district. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we have candidates sitting there that they haven't even told their district that they're, they're leaving. So you cannot work at sc two school districts if you haven't been released. So that's another um, behind the scenes that, that we don't share often. So that's another reason why a lot of them, June 30th, is the deadline date by law that you can tell your employer that I'm separating. And a lot of them are still fishing. And so when we say you make an offer, we can give them an intent. They won't come and sign until we see um, that they really have resigned and they're serious about coming to us. Because once they sign with us, we, we own them, so right. to speak. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. OK. So. And I guess just so with respect to, for example, the um, online route, I know this is in the weeds, but you mentioned it, the online routing of these mm -hmm. PRs so that if a position is funded by you know, four different sources, one piece of paper doesn't have to be signed off on by the director of BSEP and Dr. Sadler and you know, the principal, whoever it is. That, that's my understanding of what you're saying the goal is for the... Um, well, if you can, uh, yeah, right now imagine that that PR was a piece of paper would have to go to all right. those desks. So what is it, what, what do you need from the board? What's the obstacle to instituting what seems like a very reasonable and sort of 20th century, if not, you know, mm -hmm. 21st century, if not 20th century, you know, process where it's mm -hmm. electronic mm -hmm. as opposed to a piece of paper right. that has to make its way around the district building. Mm -hmm. What's the obstacle to that happening? When, or, or when will it happen? What, is there, are there resources that you don't have? Uh, is this next gov software something that we already have? Do we need to buy it? Yeah, we probably well we probably should have our director of technology probably speak about mm -hmm. that because we're having conversations with him. Um, 
Yeah, and again, it, it will require collaboration between various departments with mm -hmm. the business office, technology, um, also training and development for our principals and managers on actually how to institute the, the process. Uh, we would need time to pilot um, to make sure it's successful. Um, so in terms of being able to you know, roll out a, a pilot for, for next year, I feel that's very doable to guarantee that we'll have it up and running at 100% by next year um, is optimistic. But at this point, we're starting with the, the onboarding. Uh, NeoGov is a program that another neighboring district, uh, Hayward Unified, they use. We visited Hayward uh, earlier this year, and we feel we can learn, we can learn from them. So uh, giving HR uh, an opportunity to meet with the other departments, to um, develop a timeline would, would give us opportunity to come back to the board or work internally with the superintendent about what that will look like. At this point in time, we, uh, we have focused on these changes, on bringing teachers back, um, moving the timeline up, um, so we can bring our teachers back quickly, uh, and also exploring what would be the best option for the district. In. Okay, so I, I would, the last thing I would say is that I would appreciate that, it, that you do come back to the board in the early fall with whatever proposal or plan you have, and particularly if, if there's a resources request. Um, but in any event, I think it would be good to come back and, and share, you know, where we are on these things that you're clearly, mm -hmm. you know, working on. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. And we, we do have um, some school sites that are ready to join our force and to test the uh, waters of being paperless with their PRs and, yeah. And, and just, you know, the, we appreciate the feedback, you know, regarding signing teachers uh, early. And we will explore, you know, looking at ways to... Um, sign teachers that maybe haven't completed their credential program. So we do have that as an obstacle where they have not um, completed their credential program. Just so you know, I do provide letters of intent. I get those requests uh, to hire uh, and provide those for our teachers, uh, candidates. Uh, but we will look at um, potentially with the, having the online onboarding, uh, we can see that, that teachers coming from neighboring districts uh, have separated, I and mean, that would allow us to invite them in to sign their contracts versus just being in the dark. But Thank you. Uh, I agree with um, the recommendations of um, Board Member Alper, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm going to go to my continuing question in terms of, and our challenge in terms of our substitute teachers. And what are we doing to, in anticipation of and prevention, and, and what are we doing to ensure with the county in terms of how we can uh, possibly um, have teach, substitute teachers that would be able to be committed to, you know, longer than a month, 30 days. So I really would like that work. I don't know what it takes up front, but some work that on our part that we are ready and prepared for that should that happen because I think we've had continuous years where we've had teachers that are out and it's we have you know children's learning has been disruptive so up front I really would appreciate that our district does something more proactive in, in I don't know whether it's securing talking to the county what would it mean and how much it would mean from our district in terms of what we what we would need to provide because I think there's some requirements right, right. so yeah, I think that that's something in anticipation of uh, an ongoing issue that we've had in our district um, the other part is I, I I like the idea of signing bonus but perhaps also having that um, attached to by how soon they return it how soon they return their paperwork that might help. Um, one of the things that, um, in the past, I'd, I hope it's still not a, a, an issue that we have right now, but tracking also the time from the time a person applies for a position to the time that they finally sign. Mm -hmm. How much time does it really take our district mm -hmm. to process this paperwork and seeing uh, census-wise how does this, what does it look like? What does it look like? for you know all the different the certificated the classified how, what does it take um the other is uh, i would include in the hiring practice a survey from our teacher applicants what was their experience mm -hmm. with um, their application with our school district so that we get a sense too and some feedback uh, in terms of the timing the process you know you know it could be three 
pointed questions that you asked. It doesn't have to have, you know, a whole essay and limited number of words, um, but certainly something where we can get feedback from people who are applying to our district and perhaps ways that we can grow and ways that they really liked our process. I really like the, the, um, the paperless, and that which means that we wouldn't print, which would mean that we would have a, a, a very a process, a file system in our computer systems in terms of how we keep files. And that is something also that it both, you know, how do we protect it? How do we use it? You know, how do we secure it in a way that's, um, so that's, I think, in a very import, important conversation. Um, I definitely uh, agree in terms of bringing, I would say, even earlier in August, have an update, whether it's on our Friday notes or where we are at with our hiring of, of positions. Um, and yeah, those are my big points. Thank you. Director Alper. Director Hempel. <clears throat> okay. I believe it, it is on a fall agenda, so we will get an update on it. All right, moving on. Uh, item number 18, approval of board policy regarding debt issuance and management. Uh, who, am I, who am I talking to or looking at? So this will be a brief, present, <clears throat> brief presentation. And it is an action item. So good evening, board members, superintendent. Um, the debt management policy, it's board, board policy 3470. We met um, the debt policy, the debt management policy we had a, a meeting at the subcommittee on June 22nd, and this, um, this debt policy was approved at that meeting. And our debt policy governs um, requirements when we, when, for all our loan processes, if you will. And um, it, it, we kind of mentioned in the cover that we're committed to the long-term capital and financing planning, and we recognize that issuing of debt is a key source of funding for the improvement and maintenance of school facilities and managing cash flow. So the debt policy man, um, closely follows the debt policy in CSBA, but we had some additions that kind of clarified, um, clarified areas for the rating committee. So, um, and whereas rating agencies do not require a debt policy, we actually get points for good management if we have one. And I will be going to a rating um, meeting tomorrow. So this is very timely that we've brought it to the board so that we can um, address it. And um, I don't know, was there anything else you wanted me to mention? I, I actually want to say one thing. It was a recommendation, but it wasn't. Uh, mandatory that we right. pass a debt policy and I know the board passed the reserve policy and we had talked about a debt policy um, after we had passed the re, uh, reserve policy. All right. And the only thing I would add is that this is um, being brought to the board pursuant to our policy which is not the subject of one of the trivia questions but should have been <laughs> um, that allows us to pass a policy on first reading if four-fifths of the board approve it. We've been using that provision probably more than we should be using it. It should be rare, but this was something that we realized we had not yet done and that was important to do, and so we thought that it was appropriate to pass it in the policy committee and then ask the board to approve it tonight on its first reading. And, and we thank Assistant Superintendent Thollinsby for bringing it to us. Okay, I'll move the item. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Dr. Hemphill. I think we should have a roll call vote. Roll call vote. Director Hemfeld? Yep. Director Leva Cutler? Yes. Director Alper? Yes. President Neal? Yep. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, it's a good thing we weren't moving too fast because this item 19 is a time certain 9.30 and it is 9.34. So public hearing for an approval of additional proposal for a successor agreement between the district and the Berkeley Council of Classified Employees. Open the public hearing, 934. Close the public hearing, 934. Is there a motion to approve this item? 
Motion by Director Alper. Is there a second? Second, second by Director Vicolor. Without objection, the item is approved. Item number 19, approval of addendum extending the superintendent's contract. So, um, the, the school, uh, school board's current contract with Dr. Evans uh, to serve as, sur as superintendent runs through June 30th of 2019. There's a provision of the contract, it's technically section O paragraph five, that permits the board to extend the contract for one additional year on a one-time basis only. So we could not extend it for an additional year, we'd have to enter into a new contract. Um, if the contract is extended, we must approve it at a board meeting like this. Um, so pursuant to those terms, this item is a proposed one-year extension of the current contract with Dr. Evans, and if approved, um, he will be under contract to serve as superintendent through June 30th of 2020. As board president, I will make a motion to approve the extension of the student's contract by one year. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice President, by Director Vicutler. Let's do a roll call vote. Director Hempill? Yes. Director Leva Cutler? Yes. Director Alper? Yes. President Daniels? Yes. Carries 4-0 with uh, Vice President Appel being absent. Superintendent, congratulations. Do I give a speech? <laughs> <laughs> That's why everyone's here. <laughs> you know, I, I definitely want to thank the board for the opportunity. It's, I can't believe it's been five years. Um, in the district, it has been exciting. Um, it's definitely been challenging at times, but you know, one of the things I can honestly say that I never felt alone. It's always a group, a board decision, and I thank the board for that opportunity to be able to work with a great board, and I look forward to the next two years where we're actually doing some more, uh, I should say, incredible work in the district. Great, thank you. And at 9.36, the last the, meeting. The, um, city, the board oh, yes. So um, uh, we would just like to report out one more thing about closed session. Um, let's see. Give me one second here. We didn't, we didn't take a vote in closed session, did we? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we did. Oh, I do have it. Okay. All right. So, uh, motion by Director Alper, second by Director Hempel, um, with Director Leva Cutler also voting aye, and President Daniels voting nay, and Vice President Appel being absent. The board approved terms of a, a term of a terms of use agreement that sets forth terms and conditions between the district and the city regarding the city's use of, a board, of, of this boardroom. So I'll, I'll give you that language, Ms. Chaitis. Um, but that was also reported out um, 3.6.1. Okay, now at 3.38, the last meeting of the 17-18 school year for the Berkeley School Board is adjourned. Our next meeting, for those who, are, who, who really care, is August 22nd, not 23rd. And not the 15th. You're officially lame duck. I've been lame duck. And I would say, I thought the next board meeting was. Is in many Sorry? districts, we would have full rooms for extending the superintendent contract. Really? Yeah. Some districts. Thank you. I know a few. <laughs> but I didn't know Berkeley. You know. That's why I asked you, was anybody, did you get comments or calls? Because in, in, in Hayward, you would have. Right, exactly. Yeah, you know. here, zero. In fact, I don't really, I mean, other people did not. <laughs> I mean, I would say that, um, uh, what's the same I try to forget, McLaughlin was controversial. But I think people just didn't think, I mean, the, dis, I mean, the board. At least everybody stopped. What was the purpose?